Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening from wherever you are joining us. Uh, thank you for being here today. On behalf of the Biomedical Engineering Division uh, of IMEKI, I would like to welcome you to this year's Duncan Dawson Memorial Lecture. Now, this lecture is in honor of Professor Duncan Dawson, and so I thought I'd give a few words about him. Professor Dawson was a mechanical engineer from North Yorkshire on the east part of the UK, and he was the 107th president of IMEKI. He's known for his work on the lubrication of machine elements and natural synovial joints and the tribological characteristics of total joint replacements. He played a key role in the Ministry of Education and Science, especially promoting tribological practice in both industry and in academia. So the lecture, which honors Professor Dawson, is given annually by a world-renowned scientist in the area of biomedical engineering. And today we have the great pleasure uh, to have Professor Ali Karim Hosseini as the speaker for this year's lecture. So just wanted to say a few words of introduction to Ali. Um, Ali is originally from Canada, where he received his bachelor's from the University of Toronto. He then received his PhD in bioengineering from MIT in 2005 and became professor at Harvard Medical School, faculty at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and associate faculty at the VC Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. In 2017, he moved uh, and became professor of bioengineering in UCLA. And he's now the CEO and founding director at the Teresaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation. As you can imagine, and as you probably know of him, he has uh, his CV is enormous and outstanding. So I just wanted to tell you a little, some of the, just some highlights um, of him. So he is a fellow of multiple societies, societies such as the Biomedical Engineering Society, Royal Society of Chemistry, Materials Research Society, uh, AAAS, and a member of the International Academy of Medical and Biological Engineering, Royal Society of Canada, Canadian Academy of Engineering, Nation National Academy of Inventors, and, and, and many more. He is an author of over 700 peer review articles, more than 70 book chapters and edited books, and he has more than 50 patents and patent applications. He's been cited more than 114,000 times and has an H index of 174. Uh, now, for those of you who may not be familiar with these metrics, um, to give you a sense of how impressive these are, the Nobel Prize in Medicine that was just announced yesterday, uh, these are, this was a prize given to people in their 60s. Uh, they have metrics that are about half or a third of what Ali has accomplished. So hopefully this gives you a sense uh, of the type of impact of Ali's work. Now, he's also founded three companies, and I believe he may say uh, some things about these companies. So, um, you know, with that, again, this is just a highlight. Uh, Ali, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And, and the floor is yours. Before, I, before, I, I, before you begin, Ali, I do want to say to everyone that you can ask a question uh, while Ali is presenting. There should be an ask a question tab in your screen. So feel free to add it uh, and I will read it later. So Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alvar. I really appreciate it. Um, let me share my screen. Um, just about the comment that you made about the Nobel Prize. So that, you know, that shows that the metrics that you mentioned really are more vanity uh, metrics in terms of like the real impact is uh, almost independent of uh, those met metrics. So I hope to um, you know, to, to you know, really increase the impact, and you know, that's what um, I'm going to talk about um, for some of the work today, specifically about translation, because obviously the Nobel Prize was given for mRNA, and the reason it was given for that was because of the uh, huge impact that it made in um, in the world in COVID-19 vaccine. So, so today I'm going to talk about really um, more of the translational aspect. Uh, part of the slides have almost never talked about it in an academic forum because they're related about uh, the, you know, translational activities. But but I heard that specifically they were interested in 
um, in some of the cultivated meats aspect as well. So I decided to add that um, as well to the presentation. So um, before I begin, these are my conflicts. And um, one of the things that um, I wanted to also initially mention is how our current position at the Terasaki Institute can also enable a lot of this sort of research that um, I'm going to talk about. So just to let you know who Ter Dr. Terasaki is, uh, Dr. Terasaki um, was the pioneer in terms of creating an assay that can predict uh, which organs are going to work for which people for transplantation. So, so it's interesting because the picture on the left is actually where I was um, for my um, early part of the career at Brigham Hospital. This is where the first transplant occurred. And of course, Dr. Tarsaki had a big impact in popularizing that through his uh, HLA assay. So the Institute right now is located in three different buildings in Los Angeles area. A couple of the ones that we started off are on the top right hand side. And more recently, we um, um, renovated and started in this building in the bottom left hand side. So I definitely encourage people to um, let us know when they're in town. Um, and one of the things about the Institute is that because it has its own endowment and footprint, it allows us to do the kind of research that normally would be difficult to get funded for um, in an academic setting. And, and really part of that is what the story here is about today as well, in terms of at least the second project that I'm going to talk about being uh, fully funded by endowment because there's simply no governmental support for uh, these initiatives. So the first story I want to talk about is really about uh, this uh, story related to personalized materials. So we worked um, over the years on a lot of different materials. Um, and really the, the main purpose of a lot of these materials is to create processes or, um, or properties that are tunable for an individual. So that those could be materials that degrade based on a particular physiological response of an indi individual, or um, as I'm going to talk about now, materials that can conform to the shape of a defect or the shape of the vasculature. So, so that's part of the kind of stuff that we're doing, a lot of different biomaterials. Uh, we work a lot on devices as well, particularly integrating um, novel sensors and um, other sorts of um, smart features into existing medical devices. We also work on personalized cells, particularly on immune cells, as well as uh, um, stem cells and trying to control their microenvironment and control their behavior. Um, and a, a lot of these uh, lead to applications in tissue engineering that we enable using bioprinting technologies, as well as organs on a chip or these personalized microphysiological models which um, which um, also have very um, um, distinct applications in drug discovery. And what I'm going to talk about today, which is not a normal part of my academic talk, is this whole aspect of uh, cultivated meat, uh, what we call personalized nutrition, or really enhancing um, the, the ability to tune the, the food that we're making at the same time being able to make it sustainable um, and um, consider animal welfare, food safety, security aspects of things. Um, while I start, I just want to acknowledge a lot of different people who've uh, contributed to this work. Um, and typically, our collaborators come in all kinds of uh, professional background. So this is a typical picture where by just looking at um, the uniforms, you start seeing that there's clinicians and um, and other sorts of people who are involved um, in our research, um, you know, chemists, biologists, uh, engineers of different sorts. And this has really enabled us to understand uh, the medical problems, as well as be able to utilize the best of uh, what's uh, out there to be able to solve them. And um, I'm also very thankful to our funding sources, um, whether they're governmental or private funding sources that have enabled us to do this research. So the first story that I'm going to talk about is related to a medical problem that I really got exposed to just a few years ago. 
this uh, medical problem is um, is related to um, malformations inside the vasculature or trauma um, or other sorts of issues that causes uh, basically blood vessels to um, base to potentially rupture or causes internal bleeding or those sorts of things. So um, it's you know, as a tissue engineer who typically tries to keep blood vessels open, this was a fairly new concept for me. And it was something that um, I learned by interacting with people who are um, doing real clinical work, like interventional radiologists. So just for people who may not know, uh, this is a typical example of one. Um, let me start this. Dr. Tara Nawila joins us at the table to discuss. Tara, I think most people hadn't even heard of this procedure until yesterday. So what is it exactly and how do you discover it? An embolization is a procedure we've had since the 1970s. And basically the idea is to cut off the blood supply to a lesion in order to shrink it or to prevent bleeding. And so what we do is we take a catheter, which is a very tiny, small tube, almost spaghetti size. It goes up through an artery in the groin, into the aorta, and then into one of the renal arteries, the artery that supplies blood to the kidney. You then find the smaller artery that's supplying blood to that particular lesion. And through the catheter, you inject some sort of material, a, par a particles, a gel foam, or a coil. That essentially closes that blood vessel off. So no blood, oxygen, or nutrients can get to the lesion. It shrinks. Wonderful. So, so really, that's what um, embolization processes are. And it's about closing blood vessels uh, for different applications or filling aneurysms. Um, it's a big um, industry, um, and it's got a number of different uh, aspects. The neurovascular area, which is uh, uh, huge in terms of um, being able to address uh, bleeding or vascular malformations in the brain. Uh, tumor uh, market, which again, the idea is to deliver um, either drugs using um, particles or be able to um, cut off blood supply and peripheral app uh, vascular applications. So these are uh, different areas. Uh, they're all very important problems. And the current standard of care for most of these is basically through the use of coils. These coils basically come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. And the idea is that they will slow the blood flow in a way that blood can actually coagulate and um, and then afterwards it induces fibro fibrotic tissue formation so that you can actually um, be able to stop uh, flow in that area. If you have an aneurysm, then the coil is delivered inside um, the aneurysm, allows uh, the blood to form a clot here, and it uh, forms this clot until it gets to the edge of the um, flow here so that it just basically blocks this area, walls it off. The problem with these sorts of treatments is that there's a lot of times where um, these coils do not work. For example, here you can see um, the spine back here and you see the catheter's tip and the delivery of a whole bunch of coils inside the blood vessel. And the, the problem here is that even though there's lots of coils here, sometimes these do not work. An example of this is here where you can see, again, you know, the coils have been packed into this blood vessel, but if you put contrast upstream from this region, you start seeing this uh, contrast um, move through the coils downstream. So the coils have been enabled to stop the bleeding. And if you actually have, this is a, a gastrointestinal bleeding, you see that the bleeding continues. Now, we wanted to start really thinking about this in a different way. As I mentioned, there are typically solid embolics, which are these sorts of coils. Um, and they require um, the ability to um, to induce blood clot formation. A lot of times this doesn't happen. If you have trauma, the person loses already blood, so then um, blood uh, clot formation is hindered. Um, and also if you have um, anticoagulant medication like warfarin, again, this is hindered. The other category of embolics are what they call liquid embolics, which are polymers that precipitate in the blood vessel. So 
So these are um, uh, sorts of things that you inject again through the catheter. As soon as they get to an aqueous solution, um, they start precipitating. The problem with them is that uh, they often have very toxic uh, solvents. Um, they, um, they flow down the blood vessel and cause non-target embolization. And uh, they're really not um, applicable to many different um, applications. So we wanted to kind of address uh, the, the, ch the, the challenges with both of these. So, and we started thinking about um, a material that we were working with at the time for uh, tissue engineering applications, which is what we call injectable solid or shear thinning uh, material. Um, this material um, was developed initially by Akhilesh Gaharwar, one of my previous postdocs, and it's a combination of gelatin and nanoparticles, these nanosilicates. Um, and what this allows one to do is to form these shear thinning materials that can be delivered through a catheter here. And when they come out, they actually maintain their shape. So they don't just... Um, they don't just go all over the place. Um, they can be um, induced to form a liquid when they're under uh, forces. And then when that force is removed, they maintain their architecture. So a few years ago, we started to develop a family of these materials and then see whether they could replace these um, other alternatives for embolization. And they definitely are a family because by co combining the uh, different ratios of gelatin and nanoclay, you can get materials that are very different in their properties. So here we use the nomenclature uh, NC for nanoclay and then the percentages of the nanoclay after. So you can have things that are purely gelatin or purely nanoclay or anything in between. And um, once um, you basically combine these two materials, you have these electrostatic interactions between the two different components that um, allows the formation of this shear thinning material that can maintain its shape, for example, when it's uh, put across two cuvettes here or um, is deposited here, but at the same time can flow when there's um, appropriate pressure that's been put on it. So just to show how this works, um, this yield stress is a property of how much force you need to make a liquid flow, uh, to make the gel flow um, become liquid. And we, we can have different concentrations of this gel or different ratios of these nanoparticles to gelatin. Um, and by having these different materials, you can see that you can have materials that are very strong. So you need a lot of force to make them flow compared to other materials that are very weak. Um, they, um, they can very easily flow. And all of these materials have a re reversible property. So when you apply the liquid, basically the G prime here, uh, which is a measure of how um, uh, liquidy they are, um, goes down. So they become very liquid-like. And then when you remove the force, they go back to their solid state. Um, and this is a re repeatable process. So having this material, of course, with these properties is interesting, but we want to see how it works in, uh, in the environment and how it actually interacts with the blood vessel, with the blood. So one of the ways to do that is to see whether the material induces blood vessel, um, blood coagulation, which is something that we want in these cases. So typically, if you have uh, blood in a dish, it takes um, up to six minutes for it to uh, form a blood clot that can't be washed away easily. Um, and if you have something like all gelatin, no nanoclay, it still takes a few minutes for it to coagulate. But these nanoclays, which are very similar to hemostat uh, properties, they induce blood clot formation. So it, as you increase the concentration of the nanoplate in your material, you can get very rapid um, coagulation pathways. So you actually get reduced time to uh, clotting as you increase the concentrations of the nanoclay. Now, of course, one wants to see how these materials are, uh, behave in the body in terms of their biocompatibility. And these are some um, rodent studies demonstrating that when you put the material subcutaneously, then the material um, has a typical inflammatory behavior early on. This is by day three. You see um, lots of infl inflammatory cells, but after a few weeks, the material 
slowly degrades and is phagocytosed by the incoming cells and is backfilled with tissue. So what winds up happening is that you have small pieces of the material left as opposed to large um, sections of it. And it tissue basically surrounds it and it forms, um, uh, forms um, around it. And this behavior is a lot more uh, acceptable in terms of its biocompatibility compared to other commercially available uh, hemostats like quick clot, which has this persistent inflammation response even after longer periods. So having validated the properties of the material, we wanted to actually start looking at its, uh, its behavior in blood vessels. And um, these are some uh, early studies of rodents, in which case we took uh, these blood vessels, and we uh, basically put the material inside them um, and see how it behaves. And this is a artery that feeds the hind legs. So when we have no material here, um, you have very full uh, vascular flow. When you put the material um, inside the artery, then you completely hinder this vascular flow um, which is something that we want. Of course, this is an embolization in a rodent model, which is um, very different from humans, different uh, uh, fluid dynamics. So we want to start getting into larger models. One way to do that is to do ex vivo experiments, in this case, being able to take um, blood vessels from porcine models here. These are pig blood, blood vessels. We can connect it to an apparatus that uh, basically can control how much force you're applying to this um, blood vessel and then be able to look at the embolization and then what kind of uh, properties it can actually withstand. So here, what you can see is that uh, the pressures involved to induce um, uh, the vascular uh, the embolization to uh, break. And one of the things that you can see by looking at um, how much force you need is that um, you need um, basically many times the venous pressure or multiple times the arterial pressure to move um, some of these um, embolizations. So they can be engineered to actually have very strong mechanical properties once they're inside the blood vessel. Of course, ex vivo experiments are not sufficient. Um, and we did a lot of uh, large animal models. Um, in this case, uh, these are porcine models, again, that we, uh, we try to look at different types of um, embolization processes. Here, what you can see is that normally there is a, a large amount of flow in a blood vessel like the common iliac artery, which is a very high flow uh, environment. And after you deposit the material here, you can significantly reduce the blood flow. So um, the embolization process here has, um, has worked well. And you can do this in other applications as well. So this is the, um, the renal um, artery that um, you, you heard about in the in movie as well. Um, and again, you can see that pre-treatment, the, the vascular structures are open. Um, and once you start depositing the material, you can start um, uh, inducing embolization in these blood vessels. And afterwards, you can see that um, the entire vasculature is fully cut off from the circulation here. So these kinds of studies shows that it has lots of different applications potentially for not only blocking um, big blood vessels, but also um, blocking vascular networks. Here's a, another study that was performed to see the safety of this uh, material. In this particular case, we wanted to see whether pieces of the gel would break apart and would go downstream and induce embolization in areas that were not the right target. So to do that, what we did is that we put the material upstream from a large vascular network that can be imaged, like the lung, um, and in that case, we could see if there's uh, specific parts of this uh, vascular, um, parts of the gel that would break off and go and basically clot um, different regions in the lung. And here we can visualize this and we can look at the lung afterwards. And here, as you can see, 
by visualization, the lung is um, open and patent and actually the no region of the vasculature and the lung has been blocked off. We also look at things like biocompatibility in these large animal models. These are after uh, four weeks where you can see that in the blood vessels that have been embolized, um, you just get the same behavior that I mentioned earlier where uh, tissue starts uh, forming around the materials, degrading it. And as the material is degraded, you get a fibrous tissue formation around it, which is the kind of behavior that we want in this embolization process as we want permanent occlusion. So th these, we did a lot of these large animal models um, in our laboratories um, and our collaborators' laboratories. But to really push this forward, it required a different, uh, larger um, initiative. And I, um, you know, I was at Bob Langer's 70th birthday um, and of course, as everyone knows, Bob Langer is one of the world's top um, academic entrepreneurs. And I was um, talking to my friend Ehsan Jabbarzadeh, who is also a professor in biomaterials, but he, he has lots of interest in translating biomaterials. So I was telling him about the fact that we wanted to start a company and we were looking for good people. And Ehsan jumped on board and became the CEO of this company. And we officially founded uh, Obsidio Medical in 2019. And Esson it, 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 spent a lot of time and effort to actually push this material through the regulatory process. So everything from being able to make the material using good manufacturing practices to um, going through um, and demonstrating safety and efficacy um, in, uh, in different types of experiments until um, basically in 2022, uh, we were able to obtain um, clearance from FDA um, for the material for a very broad um, range of embolizations um, processes. So th this was great because now we had a material that we could potentially uh, uh, actually use in the clinic, but it really required a lot of additional things in terms of getting a sales force and being able to penetrate the right market, which are the kind of expertise that uh, we don't have. So we were able to find a partner and actually we sold the company um, in August of 22 to Boston Scientific, uh, which has these uh, channels uh, to really uh, get uh, clinical adoption. And I'm very happy to say that now it is a very fast growing um, product for um, for Boston Scientific and, it, and in the interventional radiology market. And these are some human um, results um, um, from, um, from this material, which actually um, now demonstrates um, its application in lots of different things, like um, hypervascular tumors, where you can see again, um, before embolization, there's a lot of um, blood flow and leaky uh, vasculature. And then once you apply obsidio, then you can actually reduce that um, and uh, get rid of a lot of this stuff and be able to treat a lot of different applications. So the hypervascular tumor is one set of applications that are happening, but there's other things like aneurysms and other things that are um, happening right now using this sort of material. And I think it's, it, for me, it was really interesting because it allowed me to go through this translational journey and then be able to take something from the beginning, um, understanding a problem all the way to clinical adoption. And it's something that, again, not too many academics like us get to do because of the huge valley of death that exists in trying to translate what you do in the lab to the real world. So that's one story. And the other story that I, um, I will kind of mention is, um, is, is really um, on a different topic. And um, it's, it's about going back and talking about the whole concept of using tissue engineering to solve um, big challenges globally. So all of us uh, have, have probably heard of um, the original work in this field by Mark Post, who 10 years ago um, unveiled the, the, the first burger that was uh, developed using tissue engineering approaches. Now, I'd be very frank that at that point in time, I was very skeptical of why even one wants to do this because I didn't really understand the impact that 
um, animal farming and industrial agriculture is having on the planet. So when I heard things that, you know, that the amount of greenhouse gases that um, this industry produces, um, obviously the land use um, and, um, and water use and the, arguably the leading cause of um, zoonic diseases, um, and antibiotic re resistance in the planet, then I started seeing, oh, wow, maybe there is something to um, being able to create um, a, a, a product like meat from this sorts of applications. Now, as many of you guys know, there's already a lot of plant-based uh, meat alternatives out there. But unfortunately, the, uh, the plant-based alternatives are not really catching, catching on. So globally, meat production um, and meat consumption is increasing rapidly, but um, but that's not the case, same case with plant-based alternatives. And when you talk to people, uh, people basically don't want to adopt plant-based because they want the real thing. They're not happy with the taste, the price, um, and the health aspects of um, of um, uh, plant-based alternatives. So we started thinking about this, and we started to come up with a um, with a process um, to uh, address um, these um, sorts of things. Um, and one of the things that we did is um, we um, basically started um, thinking about the problems in the field. So, and this this is where this company Omit came about, um, which we we started. Um, 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 in um, just a couple years ago, with the idea of trying to lower the cost um, and get the taste and nutritional profile um, all addressed. And really one of the challenges with, um, with the field right now is really this cost and scalability. So the supply chain development that I'm going to talk about um, can be used to address any kind of animal drive product and really fundamentally change how we go about uh, developing, um, uh, developing these sorts of things um, in, um, in in the world. So, so just to let you guys know, the cultivated meat process um, basically aims to take cells from livestock and then grow it in bioreactors and get the final meat product um, from that. Now, uh, the the companies are really trying to grow these cells using the either the following process where you kind of take the cells, grow it in a dish, and you use um, FBS to make the final meat, or instead of the FBS, they trying to eliminate the use of it through the use of recombinant proteins. Now, recombinant proteins, as you can appreciate, are not trivial because you, you know, FBS has lots of different molecules inside it. And um, when you think about recombinant proteins, it's hard to figure out exactly what molecules are important. But more importantly, the price is still super high with recombinant proteins. So we started thinking about, can we try to address this big um, problem in this field? And we came up with an um, alternative to FBS that addresses all the challenges that um, the, the field has, uh, like being able to address the environmental issues, animal welfare, um, and all of that, but be able to also get the prices to be more reasonable. So this is um, what um, Omit's uh, process is um, all about. And it really revolves around the things that we know from regenerative medicine. We know that um, basically adult organisms have a lot of regenerative capability, typically mediated through um, inherent biological mechanisms. So if you get a cut, then um, platelets, for example, get localized to that environment, They're, they get activated and they release growth factors locally. So we use the same kind of things that have been used um, in human medicine. For example, in human medicine, we use uh, platelet collections from humans to make uh, platelet lysates that can be used to grow um, human cells. So we use a very similar process, except we have cows as our initial su um, supply. Um, and these cows are, we do the same thing that we do with humans. We actually do plasma collection uh, from the cows as opposed to ever having to slaughter them. So this product that we started to develop, um, which is really a platelet lysate based on bovine um, or cow platelets that are um, derived in a slaughter-free manner, uh, basically allows us to make um, 
things that are just as uh, effective as fetal bovine serum, um, but at the same time address issues about um, consistency and affordability and really eliminate a lot of these human-to-human -human, um, disease transmissions that are potentially possible with, uh, with the uh, platelet lysates from humans. And one of the things that we've seen is that the platelet lysate, of course, works as well as um, FBS, if not better. Um, in most cases, with a lot of different cells that we have tested and validated um, ourselves. Um, and it's, it basically um, shows that you know, it, it works and it will work um, well for our application as well. So the, the company is basically doing something radically different from everyone else in, in, with, in that we're not trying to eliminate animals, um, which is what every other company is trying to do. We fundamentally believe that it's not the animal that's the problem, but it's the number of animals that we have on the planet. Um, literally billions and billions of animals are slaughtered every year to feed the population. And also um, the, um, the way these animals are kept, you know, they're kept in very bad conditions and animal welfare is not really taken into consideration. So what we have are basically farms that are pasture based. So the animals are always on the pastures. Um, they're never kept in feedlots. And we collect our um, platelet-rich plasma from them, and uh, we make the medium that we can directly sell um, you know, to wider people who use FBS, including people like us who use FBS in our cultures, um, and eliminate um, the use of fetal bovine serum altogether and be able to um, get um, um, that's one source of um, products. And then the other one is the actual final meat. We actually make our own cultivated meat as well and then can, um, can use that. We're pushing that through regulatory right now. So the animals that are left on the planet, the idea is to not use these feedlots, which are basically how a lot of animals are kept. A lot of the farms um, basically use these practices. Not very good for the animal and not very good for the planet. And it provides a lot of uh, emissions that are uh, basically causing greenhouse gases to be emitted. What we do is we basically use regenerative or sustainable farming practices where we have um, animals that go from uh, um, section to section of the farm. They fertilize the land um, and basically uh, the animals are never slaughtered. Um, they, um, they're part of these uh, sustainable models and they actually can be used to carbon to capture carbon and water within these systems. Now that, that addresses part of the environmental issues, but the other one is that how do we actually reduce the number of animals? And one of the interesting things about this process is that not only eliminates slaughter, but um, it actually makes a lot more efficient processes for making meat. So here, instead of having to raise um, uh, one cow um, and get um, somewhere around, around 100 kilograms of meat per year, on average, um, on if you raise it for slaughter, we can actually get 20 times more meat by having the same cow go through the same process um, and never having to slaughter it. Um, and uh, it really changes not only the animal welfare and the environment, but also the economics and scalability of this process. So if you're using fetal bovine serum, the medium is very expensive. Recombinant proteins can address that to some degree, but um, by using the um, process that we validated now in our farm and our laboratories, we can actually decrease this uh, price significantly and get us to the stage where these cultivated meat um, uh, processes can be um, as um, uh, with the same prices, same quality, same taste um, as what's in the store now. So being able to get to price parity with uh, meat that's in store now. So we've been making a lot of different prototypes. Um, these are some early versions of it. We're um, kind of pushing forward to getting um, our regulatory approval and, um, and, um, and getting it out to market uh, as soon as possible. And we're also doing a lot of work on scale up. So these are um, some of the early work on the left hand side, um, getting a 200 liter reactor work in our lab laboratory. Um, and then on the right hand side is our new pilot plant 
uh, that um, has uh, reactors um, at 2,000 and 10,000 liter scale, um, um, being able to generate um, actual um, product that can be going through this um, processes as well. So there's a lot of what I would say exciting stuff um, happening. And again, this is another area where I think um, scientists like us can have real impact and applying things that we normally use for uh, tissue engineering and applying it to new areas, for example, uh, cultivated meat um, and sustainability efforts. So the last few minutes, maybe I'll just quickly talk about um, uh, technologies um, related to um, bioprinting and um, how we can use these technologies to control tissue architecture um, and be able to use them for um, making all kinds of things that we're doing, whether it's in organs on a chip or whether it's cultivated meat, making all of them more um, effective. So one of the things um, that everyone knows is that form and function are very much related when it comes to tissues. So, and there's over the years, there's been a lot of different uh, processes that have been used to um, control um, cell and tissue architecture. These are some of the ones that we've been working on in our lab. And more re recently, we've been working on, on a lot of bioprinting technology. So as um, everyone knows, the, the bioprinting technology has taken off quite a bit in the past few years. Um, and really, the, the premise is not to get the cells to become super functional right off the bat, but is to put the cells in close proximity to each other so that they actually um, can work with each other and um, grow over time and remodel into a functional tissue structure. So normally when you put the cells, they're initially in suspension and then they start reorganizing and remodeling and forming more tissue and mature like structures. Now, one of the challenges with um, a lot of bioprinting has been that most of these are um, based on single cell or single material type printers. So we wanted to address that um, in some of our work. And a few years ago, we got inspiration from nature um, and how a spider, for example, builds um, its uh, silk. One of the things that uh, spiders do is that they have a lot of different glands that has different things inside them. And then you can actually extrude these materials um, in different combinations so that you get uh, silk of different properties. So we can get this inspiration and engineer a system that does the same thing. Here you have a number of different inlets that um, have different uh, chemical compositions. Each one of them has a programmable valve that you can open and close. And based on the combination of which valves are open, you can start um, creating all kinds of control over what materials come out um, in these systems. So here's some examples. Imagine if you have three channels with red, green, and blue dyes in them. You, if you open them sequentially, then the same, then the material will be expressed sequentially in these areas. If you open them all simultaneously, then all of these materials will be expressed. And this shows that the amount of control that you can get on this extruded uh, materials. Um, so, uh, you know, there's other engineering you can do. For example, if you have the same um, red, blue, and green, but you, when you open them, you can open multiple channels simultaneously. Then you don't only change the chemical composition along the fiber, but you can also change the topography. With other kinds of schemes, you can change um, the architecture and the surface, and you can even have multi-phase systems where you have air bubbles or oil droplets in these things. So we've started to adapt these systems to our printers. Um, be able to develop printers that um, have different materials upstream and can actually generate um, different um, downstream um, uh, mixtures, being able to have uh, different layers come out with different materials or even in the same layer in the same region have multiple materials expressed. And as you do this, you can get to more and more complex systems. So here there's one um, with seven different inlets and you can, of course, do them in um, individual binary combinations, tertiary, et cetera. So you can literally get hundreds of thousands of different combinations of these sorts of things um, uh, based on um, what you want in terms of your materials and cells. So where we're going with this stuff is we're um, using these sorts of technologies to enable the rest of the work that we're doing, whether it's in um, uh, tissue engineering for transplantation, uh, organs on a chip systems, or, or technologies um, related to 
um, um, cultivated meat and other things. So with that, um, I'll just end the talk um, just saying that um, basically we believe that uh, there's a lot of um, interesting opportunities at the interface between um, materials, uh, technology and, and devices and biology for addressing a range of different um, medical and really, you know, not only human health, but global health applications as well. And it's it's a very exciting time to be in this field to kind of uh, push a lot of these things forward. Um, with that, um, I'll just um, put this uh, um, picture, which I think is um, fairly inspirational. It's a, it's a painting by Rene Magritte um, is a self-portrait that's is him looking at the egg and drawing the bird that is emerging. And I think it's very relevant to the kind of work that we all do as researchers and the potential vision that we need to have um, to um, make it into a reality and hopefully a, um, something that ch changes how people either think or how people uh, practice their profession. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Beautiful talk and beautiful finish. That's a beautiful way to finish the talk. Thank you. Okay, so we have a number of questions from people all over the world, actually. Um, the first one is if you have ever suffered from imposter syndrome and i had to look to see exactly what that means and what that means is basically self-doubt if you have ever self-doubted yourself in your path um yeah you can talk about that yeah no a great question um you know i don't you know I, I just think that if you're ever doing something you have to deal with failure right so dealing with failure is very very common um, and for if you want to get stuff done, then you have to learn to push it forward. So I, I always felt that, you know, uh, it's uh, if you want to do difficult things, you have to be OK with failing and you have to be OK with um, uh, just pushing forward. If you have a particular vision, uh, then, you know, you should work hard on enabling it. Right. And and, you know, it's it's a journey. Right. So it's a huge journey. Um, so like for many, many years. I wasn't doing what I would say translational type of work. I was doing academic work, right? And it became like, you know, once I did enough of that and I'm like, okay, you know, um, how does one go um, to make impact beyond an impact factor? Then um, then I started thinking about, okay, what is it that um, one can do? So it's, it's really a journey um, and it's really, you know, a lot of ups and downs that will always continue. So, you know, you just have to um, be in it for the long haul and learn as, as you go forward, you have to learn, you have to make mistakes, you have to, um, you know, go backtrack and then uh, go forward. So, yeah, I don't think anyone who's ever accomplished anything has uh, probably done it easily. I, you know, self-doubt, I don't know, because I always think, you know, failing is part of success. Um, and, you know, I don't, measure myself by my failures um but but i'm kind of accepted that there's going to be failures and difficult times great okay another question on the embolization project did you also study any effects mm -hmm. on the blood pressure in nearby blood vessels or organs when you embolize blood vessels does it increase blood pressure nearby any back pressure reflux yeah good question so so obviously it changes the fluid dynamics um, of things. Um, so, you know, I don't know if it locally changes the blood pressure because, you know, when I think about fluids, you know, I kind of think about the whole system having a particular pressure. Um, and typically um, when, um, when we do a particular um, embolization, it's at a junction. So then the liquid is not kind of, um, it basically moves through the last junction instead of going through uh, where we've embolized, right? So so there is probably a little bit of increase in pressure, but you know, the systems in the body are so redundant um, in terms of their blood flow vasculature that um, it winds up 
um, at least not being a significant problem that um, yeah, people in the clinic have said, oh, if you embolize something, then it, you know, you're going to have high blood pressure. Um, locally, again, I'm not 100% um, sure, but but it's never been um, something that um, you know, we've, we've measured. Okay. And actually, in this same project, there's a question about the degradation rate for this material. If you have measured or what is, what is the degradation rate? Yeah. And obviously, we had to look into that quite a bit for getting regulatory approval. Um, we did experiments that were up to six months uh, for the regulatory approval. And basically, a lot of it goes away, but not all of it after six months. Um, and, you know, but, but there was no uh, toxicity that could be observed anywhere, um, you know, as the material went away. And then the other thing is that there was no re-bleeding or, you know, issues with the embolization failing um, over time. So, so we are not totally, um, you know, kind of clear exactly um, where all the material goes. Likely there's like, you know, cells, macrophages uptake them, some of them, and then uh, some of them like, you know, like obviously gelatin can get remodeled and degraded pretty easily. So, but we do know that um, we do know that the material kind of stay still stays to some degree even after six months. Okay, now with the omit part of your talk, um, you mentioned about sustainability in terms of release of greenhouse gases. Do you think using large scale industry level bioreactors for meat production would release less? greenhouse gases or cut down CO2 emission? So here's, that's a really good question. I, you know, I, you know, I can refer to um, some of the work that's been done to model the life cycle analysis of these processes. So anything, if it's not done properly, then could be, you know, not good. Right. So, so for example, like um, there's been work that shows that, okay, if you're using, recombinant proteins and you're using the same practices that are done in pharma to uh, purify these recombinant proteins at large, large scales, then it winds up being worse for the environment compared to if you're not um, doing that, right? So, so there's always like, you know, you have to look at every process very clearly and understand the ch challenges. Like, obviously, I don't know, like, if you're making a big bioreactor and your steel comes from a process that is very harmful uh, for the planet, then that's going to mean uh, something bad compared to a different supply chain that may be better. Um, so, so these have to be looked at very specifically. But um, in the cases that the things are done properly, it winds up being significantly better. Um, you know, obviously, like uh, I can tell you some numbers, like something like ninety-five percent uh, better um, in terms of um, um, land use um 98 better in water use you know so there's lots of kind of um, um aspects that are better and, and significantly better in terms of greenhouse gases as well so if it's done properly okay uh, with regards to the 3d printing the multiple nozzles where do you see these being applied and, and you see them being applied with the meat project y yes um definitely they could, um, you know, just for us right now. So um, it's something that is really exciting. But for the meat area, I think the biggest challenges are always cost and scalability, which is why the company has focused on ground beef as opposed to textured steaks. Because um, I just think that it's it's going to be a um, it's going to be a long road, and the simplest you make it initially, the better. Um, so, so we haven't really done much in terms of combining the three D printing with the cultivated meat yet. There are other people who are doing that, um, but yeah, down the road, um, I think is definitely um, as one is trying to build complexity um, in terms of you know whole cuts of uh, different sorts of meats, then I think, yeah, the, the kind of 3D printers that I showed could be useful. 
Great. Another comment here. Thanks, Ali, for a really interesting, engaging, and inspiring talk. Linking to the Margaret painting you show, what do you think is the next big thing in yeah. this area? Well, I think, you know, you always see, like, you know, one of the things about being around is that you see trends, right? So, you know, obviously the next set of big trends um, that are really going to be relevant for even this area are not only AI, so, you know, thinking about how AI could be relevant for a lot of these things, or, um, and problems related to longevity, um, you know, aging. So those are some things that are, I think, going to be big for the next few years. Um, so if one wants to be early on them, then, you know, those are kind of areas that I would look into. And Ali, I actually have a question. I'm going to jump in here with regards to to translating, because you have really become sort of really focused on translation. What advice would you give people who might want to jump into the translation focus? Um, yeah. Maybe something you've learned along the way, or what's the biggest? Yeah. So I would say, you know, it, again, I, I, you know, like you know, you mentioned you know, my academic thing. So I was really, 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 you know, 100% focused on academia for a long, long time, right? So to me, the first thing is you have to want to do it and you have to put in the time, you know, because it's going to be taking time away from other things. So so I basically said, okay, you know, I, I choose that my metric for impact is not going to be my H index going forward. It's going to be you know, how what I do in my lab affects the real world, right? So you have to kind of think about it. You have to change mindset, you know, be um, comfortable sacrificing particular things. Um, and then the other thing is to, you know, really see uh, whether you're, what you're doing is going to be relevant or not. It's going to make an impact in terms of, um, you know, what what the endpoint is. You know, if, if you wind up doing something that is not going to be very impactful is still going to take a long time. You just, you know, you're just going to realize at the end, oh, you know, not many people care. So, so that's kind of like figuring out the problem, figuring out the question, the differentiator, um, how it's, it solves the big problems in that area, I think are all going to be important. Okay. I have another question here uh, along those, along that area. What, have, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start his her adventure in the biomaterials field? Yeah, I would say, first of all, I think it's a great area. I think it's like a um, very broad um, uh, area that you can make impacts in. And I've kind of shown a couple examples all the way from medicine to human health um, to planetary health. Um, so uh, I think that, you know, just being in good environments, picking good mentors, um, getting educated by surrounding lab members who are all um, really um, great, I think would be something that I would recommend because that local ecosystem will teach you a lot of things. And for me, that was the time that I went to MIT and worked for Bob Langer. So it really um, elevated the way I think. And um, and I've continued to learn, uh, whether it's from him or other people in my local environment. So I think that's really important. Okay, another one here. When growing meat in a bioreactor, do you have to use antibiotics? That's a good question. For I actually didn't know this when I started the, the field because there's no published work on industry and whether they use antibiotics in these reactors. But the, the gist of it is there's no antibiotics being used. So everything is so sterile that without antibiotics, we have to make sure it works. Okay, and do you need it to be vascularized? Um, so we're working on ground meat. So obviously ground meat doesn't need to be vascularized. Um, I think for um, structured meat, um, I think it needs to be porous, um, not necessarily vascularized. It needs to be porous for uh, perfusion um, so that, you know, the cells remain uh, viable, but, you know, it doesn't have to have an endothelial lining, which is what makes it a lot easier. And Ali, I think we have one more minute here. I'm going to throw again another question here, which is your vision about biomaterials for translation. So do you, do you, what's, what's your focus? Do you have a balance between new biomaterials or you always work with materials that are well used already? What, what yeah. do you play with this? I would say if you can 
get away with using materials that have been used, then I would do that. You know, there's there's so many challenges with trying to get really new things, um, you know, out in the world. That and it's already everything. What 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 we do is already difficult enough. Even if you're, you know, what I showed you with just gelatin and you know laponite, which is already used in toothpaste and things like that. So even that requires a lot of things. If you have like fancy materials, it may it just makes it more difficult. It's not impossible, and a lot of you know important things comes from that. But it's just the journey becomes a lot more difficult. Great, perfectly. Thank you. I think we're out of time now. So I just would like to, uh, just to finish, to thank you very much for this fantastic and inspiring presentation, showing us your work. It was a pleasure to have you for this year's Memorial Lecture. And yeah, we, we look forward to following your, your work and your progress. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.